I was talking to John Awada about 10 minutes ago, and <laughs> IBM has a <clears throat> new way of working that he'll be talking about in a moment, but he encourages everybody to start a meeting with a story. So I brought a little prop, <laughs> uh, which is Herman Miller Honeycomb Honey. I was at Herman Miller last week, and they gave me this, and I said, branded honey? <laughs> tell me about this. And when they finished this beautiful lead building for their designer studio, they all of a sudden noticed thousands of wasps, huge wasps. And they talked to some eccentric beekeeper um, in Grand Rapids and she said, you need bees because when the bees come, the wasps will disappear. So not only did the bees come, but then all these beautiful wildflowers grew. And as a result, they produce this Delicious, delicious honey. Wow. So for me, here we have Herman Miller, okay, this icon of design thinking for decades. And now look what they've done with you know, a problem that they then made into a wonderful, wonderful surprise. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Aaron to get our conversation started, but that is our, our centerpiece for today. And, and actually a really good segue story because I think the first topic we really wanna get into is sort of expanding the aperture on design. When people first come to the word of design, to the idea of design, they probably think of it very narrowly. One of our sort of jobs and mandates as a group is to broaden that definition and talk about design thinking and all the different manifestations that it can have. And so the first sort of provocation to the group is maybe to talk about ways that design or design thinking has kind of played a role in solving a problem within your organizations or organizations you've been part of in the past similar to this, but probably not with quite such a delicious uh, outcome, um, to kind of get a sense of all the different ways that it's showing up in, in our lives, in our businesses, and, and help people understand just how impactful and how broad design thinking can be. So um, maybe, Alex, you, you could start by just sharing some of the things you guys are thinking about and working on now, some sure. problems that are being solved in new ways. We, I'll tell you, it's tough to bite a jet engine, so it's not <laughs> outcome. I, I work at General Electric, and I help run innovation. We have, the biggest thing that we're focused on right now, I shouldn't say the biggest thing, but one of the most interesting things we're focused on is um, sort of the democratization of design. So aided by new manufacturing techniques, we have the ability now, or starting to have the ability, and not just GE, but the world, to really link design and actual products. So. What we're seeing now with 3D printing and prototyping and small batch manufacturing, we've been able to really shorten that cycle for design so we can actually get things in a customer's hands very, very quickly, get feedback, do iterations, as opposed to, we were talking about this earlier, the way we used to do things at GE, where we would, have, we would hunker down for three years, come up with what we think is the perfect design, not really talking to customers, build a $150 million factory to launch it, and roll the dice and hope that it worked which is obviously not a best practice in product design. So we're turning that around and doing a lot of open innovation and crowdsourcing on the front end of design, tapping into sort of the, the global brain to see new designs that are coming from the outside world as opposed to just our closed um, past approach, rapid iterations and seeing what customers say. So for us, it's been a real shift in the way that we design our big hardware and our, our software as well that we're now creating with what's called the industrial internet, which is sort of big data and analytics sitting on top of our big machines. Some of my team members took some of our CR people down to our community relations people down to Joplin and ran boot camps and firsthand with education because they were looking at how do they look at high school education. So we took some of them down and put them through a boot camp there and sort of experienced how design thinking would work in the social form. And they came back really excited and said, hey, let's do this for library makeovers. So we did these boot camps all over the country. And uh, it was really interesting is sometimes there's parents saying this is the first time someone's listened to me. Um, and students too, like, wow, no one ever asked me what education means. And then we were able to prototype right there with students and educators. And there was an interesting story of um, through the process that we had to uh, change our language and think about, you know, we're used to working in a corporation and talking about how we talk about design and our lingo. And we had to change it in working with the education. That was part of the prototyping process is we prototyped like, okay, you know, we need to go back. My team went back quickly and said, okay, we need to change how we're talking about these terms as we talk to students and educators. They're not used to speaking this language. They're not used to this. So we were prototyping the process while we were prototyping 
the actual school makeover or library makeover idea. If I connect this to this discussion, so design thinking and uh, is it a department or is it something that you just deploy in a corporation as a, as a capability? It also gets to collaboration. So here's a story of collaborating with the Human Resources Department on a problem to solve called um, our culture. So we're probably one of the few companies in the world that can run ads on television and say, I'm an IBMer and have a brand associated with a human being. Question, and it's hugely differentiated, and it's, it's true in hundred and more than 150 countries. Question, what is an IBMer? All of our brand research shows that the client's interaction, client, university, community, et cetera, their interaction with the IBMer trumps their interaction with the product. So as much as we might obsess over the product design and the product experience, here's a problem. If your brand is mostly defined by the interaction with the human being, and we have 430,000 of them, and they work in 173 countries, and they're very highly educated, which means they're very independent thinkers, and they're from every culture of the world, how can you des de deliver a consistent, differentiated, intentional experience through human beings? Okay, so we partnered with HR earlier this year because the to-do from the CEO was improve the client experience. You get to the IBMer as the big driver of that. How do we deliver a consistent experience to humans? So we, we applied design thinking. And one thing we did was scale is an advantage. We said, let's ask 430,000 people why they, <laughs> why they care about being an IBMer. And what makes an IBMer an IBMer, not just another person with a good background and a person of good character. So we use a social network inside the company, and for 72 hours, the CEO invited the entire workforce to jump in here, and we had fora and different ways to facilitate this, but it's basically untethered, go. And in 72 hours, they created the equivalent of 200 novels of content. Wow. We then applied analytics to, you know, what did they say? And we also had 250 people, independent of each other, read it all and tag it. And we correlated the tags of the humans with the analytics, and we found very clear threads to say, no, no, there's no question that at least the IBMers feel that what makes them different when they're at their best, it's not true every day, we look like this. That became nine practices. Um, and then when it was launched uh, in June of this year, we launched uh, an app for every IBMer. Um, it's our purpose, our values, and our practices it's called 139. It's a storytelling app. And we pre-populated the app with stories from the jam. We call that thing a jam. But we also said, um, we're going to learn how to be an IBMer, not through process or through education, but through stories. So here are some stories behind each practice but also contribute stories and start a ritual. Start a meeting, share a story. Start a meeting, share a story. You'll understand big companies, right? You, you sort of <laughs> introduce this thing and say, do it. And people said, where am I going to get a story? Well, get a story here. And three months later, we have 2,500 stories, and they grow every day. And they're socially rated. I love the story. You know, it's relevant. They're uploading stories via video. They're just typing stories in. Posters are being created, illustrations. And so what's happening is in problem solving through design, intentional, but it's not a product, it's a culture.